All right, so okay, here we are today. Uh, Ditch Digger CEO today. We've got an awesome friend of mine here that uh, I've got had the blessings to get to meet here a few years ago. I, I I knew about you, had some conversations with you about, I can tell you, three and a half years ago. Uh, and I thought, man, what a cool guy. I got to meet this guy. And I had, we had some mutual friends. And uh, Robert, I don't know if you remember this, but my wife had just got, gone through brain surgery. She was in radiation and chemo. And I heard about this, this, this really cool guy that had a, a trip lined up to go visit the Pope. And uh, another friend of mine, uh, it, it was uh, John Stromberg. Said Gary, I got this friend of mine. He, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I know how, how strong Cheryl is in, in your Catholic faith. This friend of mine's uh, got got uh, some contacts. He's able to go set up a meeting with the Pope, and he said he he would include Cheryl if if you guys were available, right? I said, oh man, this is like it'd be a dream to her, right? It'd be amazing. And so I called, I called, talked to John, and I can't talk to you, and you said, Gary, hey, whatever we can do, I'll make sure you guys are included. Well, when we looked at looked at her condition at the time and talked to our doctors, they said, "Oh, probably not the best idea to do right now because she wasn't. We had we were we were not we hadn't gone through therapy yet, PT, and all the other things we had to do. And there's a date you guys had, and we're like, ah, it's probably not the right time, unfortunately. So we had to push it off. But I'll never forget how accommodating you were and awesome you were, a person I never knew before, never met before, going out of his way to to try and get my my awesome wife in front of the Pope, which is so cool." So thanks for that, buddy. And that was so that was originally I'm like, dang, I got to meet this guy. And then I find out he's the ping pong guy. He's a ping pong table and ping pong paddle guy, right? Killer spin, and 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 killer spin. I got to know a little bit because some of my teammates in my business uh, uh, love ping pong like I do, and they got into a couple tournaments downtown. They're all Chicagoans, so you know, got playing in these in these tournaments sponsored by you guys, I guess, uh, Robert at the time. So I heard more and more about killer spin, and. Uh, I got my ping pong paddle and and uh, ball right with me here today. Actually, you know, uh, think, let, thinking let about me, you. Let's see this. Huh? I, I think we got to fix your problem. What's I it? thought you're the. Don't you believe in the free enterprise system? I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, what's a the brand there? I don't know, man. Somebody bought this for me, but it's Pro uh, something, and that's Power. What's that brand? Power. Yeah. Pro Power. What's that? Yeah. That's it's. It's a, it's a, uh, that's a Bernie Sanders paddle. Oh no, get out of, get out of, go. Oh. <laughs> Gosh, you got to get me one of your I paddles. Do you, uh, a real one. Why is that made in China? Mine's no, no, no. I'm just saying it's, it's probably a commie racket. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Is it China or something like that? Uh, everything made in, everything's made in China. I'm just Except, you know, then, but, listen, Kelly Spin believes in the free enterprise system. Yeah. I can vouch for anybody else. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So, Hey, uh, so again, blessings to meet you. And then all of a sudden, uh, a year or so ago, I'm at the Republican Governor Association uh, annual uh, one of our one of our quarterly meetings, and this this dude gets up and talks. You know, has some amazing questions for this panel of governors, and uh, and uh, he mentions something about uh, you got to get a little color in this room. You know, so I forget how it went, but what you said was funnier than heck. And had a lot of guts to say what he said. It was just cool. So I said, "Oh, that's it, that's it, Robert, dude. I got to meet." So I, I went across the room. After you, we, you and I got to talk, and then told you, you know, what I knew of you from before. And we hit it off, and uh, we've had awesome conversations. And uh, you're a guy that I'd love to get to get get to be better and better friends with as we get as we get into the middle age. You know, we're young guys now, but as we get to be a little older and more mature, I want to get to know you better, buddy, because uh, I think we got a ton of stuff in common. Uh, so don't be, don't be disappointed if I get older, but not more mature. Uh, you know, I, actually, I never want to grow up. I said all the time, I never want to grow up. It's it's too much fun being a kid, right? Um, so what, what we want to do, like always, Robert, you know, we're going to we're going to talk about who you are today, and then we want to go back and, and talk about you know what made you who you are today. Um, you know, I, and and you know, and we're both going to just throw questions at you here and there as we can. Yep. But uh, tell tell us what you are today, what you do today, who, who you know what. Who, who, is, who is this Robert Blackwell dude uh, today? Well, I um, today I, I run two companies. One is called uh, EKI Digital. It's a management and technology consulting company. And we're actually changing the name of the company to Quant16. And it is going to be a digital asset investment advisory company. So I used to be a trader for a long time, and I'm just kind of a – a math guy, and nobody's really a, applied quantitative investment strategies to the digital area. So right. that's what we do. We, we've helped people identify billions of dollars of 
new revenue and efficiencies in their businesses and in government. So we're going to transition to being a digital investment advisory company. The other company is a company called Killerspin. And Killerspin, I say we exist to help people connect to the people that they love and that need their love through break time play. So we think about how we can connect family, friends, customers, and employees. I think there's two big trends in the world. There's the digitization of everything, and then there's the rebellion against the digitization of everything. So we think that people need people, and break time play connects people. Awesome. And uh, so when you look at these two companies, which uh, you know, what which one was uh, was started? You know, when did they start? Um, and uh, what was the vision you had for these two two organizations? So uh, maybe I can take a minute and I can just give you my pre-canned little boring speech on mm-hmm. <laughs> where I was born to where I got to today. Awesome. Love so it. I was born in Philadelphia, and but I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. My father's from Philadelphia. My mother's from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And... They went to school at uh, Wichita State. That's where they met. Uh, so I I lived for, I'd say, most of my very young years in Wichita, Kansas. Mm-hmm. And um, I was lucky because my parents didn't have any money. They were educated people, people of really good character. But I say they were so broke they couldn't pay attention. <laughs> my father was 23 and my mother was 20 when I was born something I cannot imagine uh, doing. But I got really lucky in life because I had really great parents. And essentially they let me do whatever I wanted to do as long as I followed some basic rules. The basic rules were, number one, speak the English language. Mm -hmm. My parents were really sticklers about using proper grammar. Now I'm a math guy, I never figured it out. (laughs) So if I would say things like, oh, I've never been here before, my mother would say, before what? (laughs) In a sentence with a preposition. I mean, it was like that. Um, And what they expected was that we just do our best, not embarrass our family, and be honest people, and treat everybody well. Those were kind of the rules in my house. Mm -hmm. Great Uh, rules. So when when I was young, I went to, I started school when I was four years old. I think I was a part of the first kindergarten class, which would have been in 1965. Yeah. Uh, Luckily for me, even though my parents really didn't have any money, uh, I walked to school when I was four and five years old by myself. That's how people do uh, today. And I remember when I was five, I I would walk around and there were these recycling Coke bottles. You know, when people would drink Coke, mm-hmm. you would have to uh, recycle the bottles. Yeah. So they Re- refundable. Was it? Uh, what is it? Five cents. I would just pick them up, and I'd go turn them in for the money. Yeah. So that was my first little money making thing when I was five, and I really liked it. And so when I was eight, I noticed that when I was. Uh, that when the kids would go out for lunch, there was a candy store that was not too far from our school. So people would go and buy candy. Now, the problem in those days, if you got back late, teachers could actually hit you, (laughs) paddle you with these thick paddles with holes in them. Uh, So there was a pretty big disincentive (laughs) for being late. I don't think those disincentives exist today. No. but I noticed that everybody, they still wanted their candy. Candy. So I saved my money. I bought a little money from my father. And I went and bought bubble gum. They used to have these long sticks of gums called Bub's Daddy. Yep. And so I'd go buy them for a nickel and I would sell them for a dime. So I was like eight years old. Maybe I made $20 a day. So this is 1969. I can't imagine my father <laughs> made a whole lot more money than that. Um, but I really just like being in control of my own destiny. Mm -hmm. Naturally, I'm a super introverted person. Um, And I kind of have a kind of a weird math brain. So I did that. And then in 1973, 
we moved to uh, Chicago. My father, he got a job from uh, from IBM. He got transferred. We got transferred to Illinois. So he moved in Chicago. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in an all black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I only saw white people on TV hmm. other than some of the friends my father would work with. And even though this was the 19, you know, 60s and uh, while my father was, I'd say, very pro-black, mm -hmm. he was not anti anybody else. Mm -hmm. So he made sure that we never judged anybody by what ethnicity they were and he never bought into white people evil stuff which was to be honest with you a lot of us were taught because uh, -huh. uh you know things had happened but my father never bought into that um so he would make sure that he went and he took us to meet people from all backgrounds uh, because in our neighborhood we lived in an all-black neighborhood. My grandparents in Louisville and in Philadelphia lived in all-black neighborhoods. That's a time where there wasn't a lot of interaction sure. between blacks and whites. And, uh, it was a very different time then. Um, so we moved to Chicago. Let me, let me stop here. Isn't it crazy to think, look at, if you look, you look at Robert, he doesn't look his age, and I, he's telling his age, doesn't look at it at all. So it's hard to imagine, right? In his short life, that, that that only you know when he was a kid, that it was that d different, right? Yeah, that is crazy. amazing. The short period of time, all things have changed. But but I mean, there's still goes on. But I mean, uh, sorry about that. But go on. No, it's no problem. So we moved to Chicago, and I remember my father was looking at by at where we were going to live. So uh, my father. Uh, comes to Chicago. Of course, we don't know anything about Chicago. Uh, all you read about, and frankly, back then it wasn't very different. You know, it's dangerous, a bunch of gangs and things like that. Uh, so my father, the him, my mother found a place, I think, in Chicago that they were looking at getting, but the head of the school board at the time was a guy named Manfred Bird. And my father said, I want to get my kids into this school. I heard this is a good school, so I'd like to get my kids in this school. And Manfred Bird said, you don't get to decide where your children are going to go to school. I'm going to decide it. Hmm. And my father said, no, you're not. So he moved. He went to the suburbs. Now, and so we first lived in Lombard, excuse me, in Glen Allen. Mm -hmm. For a little while, and then we lived in Lombard. So we were the really the first, I'm pretty sure, black family in the western suburbs. Huh. Uh, I know in Glen Ellen, and then in um, and then the Lombard later. So we were in a year, and we were in Glen Ellen. So I was in junior high, mm -hmm. and so I was in in junior high, and of course, I'm the only black person there. It wasn't very friendly. Um, but I had been selling gum and making money in Wichita, and I suspected white people probably like gum as well. So, so, you, so you moved the business too. You moved the business and everything with you. Yeah. So I was twelve years. I was twelve years old, and I never. First, I'd never done well in school. Uh -huh. I, I would just say I was a, a not. I call myself a non-dangerous delinquent. <laughs> uh, so I brought that business to to the school, and yeah, it turns out everybody liked gum there as well. So I, <laughs> funny. in fact, I was selling so much gum that they people didn't have enough money to buy ice cream anymore. <laughs> so I remember the uh, the vice principal. He tried to get me to stop selling gum. I said, "Is there some rule against this?" No, but I don't want you to do it. And then, so he called my father and my father said, is there a rule against it? And he said, no, but we're losing money. And he said, not, <laughs> money? not my problem. <laughs> You're competing against the principal and, right. and the P and it was yes. maybe the PTO's I, money. My father, you know, it was great. He supported me. He said, he's not breaking any rules. Don't call me. 
<laughs> uh, so they ended up having to do a deal where I sold my ice cream and I sold, excuse me, I sold my gum and their ice cream. There you go. Whoa. So, um, yeah, it was kind of an interesting year. No, wait, 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 wait. Were you getting a commission on that as a reseller yeah. or what? Modern day partnership. Tell, you, tell us about yeah. that. So, no, since he couldn't stop me from selling my gum, I made a deal with him to sell my gum and his ice cream. Mm -hmm. So they did a deal with me and I got a cut of the ice cream <laughs> and I got to sell my gum. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, also at the time, I remember because I was just a total screw up in school. Um, in fact, um, my mother couldn't figure out what's wrong with me. Uh because I didn't appear to be totally stupid. <laughs> so she had me tested. She went and took me to this place and had me tested. Mm -hmm. And so they tested me in math. And I came up with a better answer than they had. So they told my parents, maybe your kid's not totally dumb. <laughs> not applying himself. So, um, she told me that, I mean, maybe a couple of years later, I didn't even remember that. I didn't even know that. <laughs> so I go to, uh, I go to high school. My parents moved to Lombard mm -hmm. and I get, so what high school was that? That was Lombard East. Okay. Yep. So again, we're the, uh, we're the first, no other black families anywhere around. Mm hmm. So we move in and we have a bomb thrown in our house. We go home on, on our lawn. And uh, lucky my, my mother was in Kentucky with my siblings. And me and my father were here. So obviously that wasn't very fun. Hmm. No uh, way. But, but my father said, suck it up. We're not going anywhere. That's what he said. <laughs> Uh, and so we did, I got through it and went to, uh, went to, to, uh, Glenbard East, but the experience, I ended up getting in lots of fights all the time. Um, it's fun. Kind of, most of the fights I got in were of my own making <laughs> because I just hated to see like kids pick on kids with special needs. Uh -huh. I just had no tolerance for that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you, you were experienced a little bit of your own, right? Not special needs, but just a different different kid, different look, different whatever, right? Just like a special needs kid it, it would, would experience this stuff. So you were, you were using your own experience, and you're not, well, you're not letting it happen to other people. It wasn't my own experience. I just thought it was wrong. Yeah, that's awesome. To, you know, to take advantage of people that were weaker than you. Yeah. Uh, to yeah. me... That's what cowards do, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't take any courage to go fight somebody a lot smaller than you and has some special challenges. So it's something that I just really bothered me even at a, at a really young age. Awesome. So I went to school and, uh, you know, I was still a goof off. I mean, it wasn't that I was goofing off. I was trying to make money. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't really paying attention in school. So I never really liked it. It's just a place to go and make money. Um, <laughs> it was your market. Yeah. So, um, and you know, I couldn't really relate to people. I had never, these were like foreign people to me. In fact, it was weird. All my friends ended up being foreigners. People from all kinds of places in the world. And I ended up kind of being friends with them because I couldn't be friends with the other people hmm. because kind of all this racial tension. I would, thought I had a friend and I'd say, could I, uh, hey, my brother has to go to the bathroom. Can I take my, can you, my brother use your bathroom? My, my brother's nine years younger than me. Mm -hmm. So he's pretty small at the time. Said, no, my parents won't let black people in the house. What? So yeah. So at that time, so this is 1970. Four probably. And so luckily 
for us because my sister actually told my parents she couldn't take it anymore. And they had to send her back to Wichita, Kansas. Wow. So she went back to Kansas to go to, to go to school there and live with one of uh, my aunt. Your sister's older than you? No, I'm the oldest of five. Okay. So she, so she was a couple years behind you? Yeah, she's 21 months younger than me. Okay. And it was just too much stress for her. Mm-hmm. She couldn't take it. Yeah. So my parents sent her back there. So she went to school there. She came back a couple years later and then went to Glenbard South. Um, so me going through this, I um, it wasn't until I was 15 that I kind of, I had made, I'd done two things. I... I was with a counselor at school because, you know, you have to, everybody has to go to the counselors. Yeah. And the counselor said to me, you know, I think you're a guy of average intelligence and ability. (laughs) You should be a carpenter. (laughs) That was the advice he gave me. So I went home and I told my father this. And my father said, what do you expect? You don't apply yourself. You're not doing your best. What do you think they're going to think of you? And that kind of really, that really hit me. And then when I, I'm like 16 and I get involved in Hapkido, which is a martial arts. Because mm-hmm. I, I before that I was in wrestling and then I was in judo. So I, I started to get these little bits of discipline. And uh, my father was really picky about and one of the things my father, my father said two things to me, which I'll never forget. We said three things, so I'll never forget. The first is, don't piss off your mother. <laughs> <Off the trouble. laughs> Standard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Number two, he said, in life, the only thing you have is your name. Mm-hmm. You can always make more money back, but you can never get your name back. Yep. So you have to protect that. The other thing he said to me is, if I give a, I may not be the best in the world, but if I give a hundred percent, I'll be in the top five percent. Mm. So those things kind of stuck with me. And the other thing is, when I moved here, I luckily grew up where my parents never taught us that there was anything wrong with being black. Mm. It didn't make you better than anybody, but it didn't make you worse than anybody else. So all the stuff that I think that we were forced to to see, there used to be in the library, these little black Sambo books, and you'd watch things on TV, and it was about pimps, and it just represented black people really poorly. Sure. And my parents said, you're never going to act like that. So they, they they did never allowed you to be a, the victim. They uh, they they expected you to to not have crutches, right? But 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 consider everything as a as a blessing and a learning opportunity, and and you establish grit that other people may not have ever established uh, as victims, right? Yeah, I would say that's right. It's like we live we live in a world where it's just harder for us. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not fair, but it is what it is. However, that's not an excuse for you. Mm-hmm. So I think it was, I think I was actually luckier than my younger sibling, my younger siblings, because they didn't really have to go through my, so I have my one sister is 21 months younger than I have a sister who's five, uh, seven years younger, nine years younger, and then 11 years younger. The world really changed a lot between 1974. Those, was that four sisters? No, I have one brother and three sisters. One brother and three sisters, okay. Yeah. So it's sister, sister, brother, sister. But you, you had to grow up being the leader of this 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 family, you know, these little these little sisters and brother, right? So, so you you had to grow up to lead naturally and, and, and be the, and, and that's be the what barrier I was, breaker. I didn't really do a great job at that in retrospect. Mm-hmm. I was a loner. Kind of later in life, I felt like I could have done a much better job taking, um, helping, being more of a family person than uh-huh. I was. 
Um, yeah, I don't look in retrospect. I don't think I did a very good job at that. I love my siblings, but I don't think I did a great job uh, when I was young. I had my own drama to deal with. Um, and my parents, right, didn't push a lot of that on me. But in retrospect, I wish I would have done a better job. Um, so, anyway, so I'm 16 years old. I had been be my mother used to smoke, so I I begged my mother for years since I was four years old. Stop smoking. Um, and then when I was uh, 16, I said, uh, I was actually it was 15. I said, I'll make you a deal. If I get straight A's, will you stop smoking? <laughs> and she said, yes. Wow. So 15, 16, I, I started two things. I started practicing Hapkido and I got lucky enough to get his instructor, his name was Master Chang, and it changed my the way I behaved. I got a lot more discipline. Hmm. So the combination of that, which I found something that I was really good at, that I could excel at, that I was better, I think, than all the other people in the school. So I decided uh, that I just made a decision I was going to get straight A's because I love my mother. And I did. <laughs> awesome. I went from, listen, I failed geometry, which, and I'm like such a math guy that it's almost like embarrassing. It's like Michael Jordan failing jumping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I just changed my mind. Did your mom quit smoking? She quit smoking when I was in college. She, she, it took her about a year and a half because I, I wanted to get out of high school at 16. I could have. Um, she didn't let me. She made me wait until my 17th birthday. All right. Um, that's that's some uh, accelerated learning that, that happened in a short period of time that allowed yeah. you to do that. All right. So that's once I decided I was going to do it, then I just I did it. And I went to summer school to make up some stuff that I'd screwed up. <laughs> and then I just was determined to get out. Um, and then I went to school in UIC and I studied math. Um, so as I was recollecting this time in my life, I remember what my mother told me when I was 12. So I remember when I was 12, I was thinking about kind of systems and what would happen if you just kept dividing things. You just kept dividing and kept dividing and kept dividing. What, what what patterns would come out of that? So at 12, I developed my own theory of fractals, <clears throat> which I never even realized uh, what that was. In fact, Fractals Act never came about in, until the mid-70s. There was an IBM engineer that came up with this whole theory of, of fractals. That, uh, so, and so on one hand, I've always been kind of just a math person. Um, so I go, I go to school, I study, uh, I study math because it's easy because I can't read. Um, I think I've gotten through life and maybe I've read two books. I just would go to the back of the chapter. So, wait, look. wait. So at this point in time or, to, or today, two books? No, I listen to lots of okay, books. Okay, there you go. Okay, there you go. My phone, I probably have 200 books that I've listened to mm -hmm. and maybe another 150 I uh what do you call it, podcasts and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, I spend a couple hours every day educating myself. Awesome. Uh, but I, I'm not very good at reading, mm -hmm. like reading paper. Yeah. Um, so when I was in college, I just listened, and I noticed the pattern. They would just tell you what was going to be on the test. Mm -hmm. You're right. Oh, so just go read the summary. <laughs> They're going to tell you what's on the test take the test. That's all that matters. True. That makes you, nobody, they don't care if you learn anything. They just want their money for their credits and you want the grade. Yeah. So I did that and then I uh, got done with that. I, then I started working at IBM. So what was your degree? A math, math degree? or in Math. I studied math and psychology. Okay. Studied math because it was easy in psychology. I got to figure myself out. <laughs> did it work? Uh, I, the math is easy still. Did you figure yourself out yet? 
I, no. <laughs> no. I, I know myself. Uh, other people have trouble, but hey, what can I do about that? <laughs> Save that for your 60th birthday, huh? So I, uh, I went to work at, uh, at IBM. So my father was a sales manager at IBM for a long time. My father is a great sales, a great salesman. Uh, and he's a great human being. So when my father was at IBM, my father would be the person that was fighting for opportunities for blacks and for women. In fact, I remember at his retirement party, he, uh, a lot of people came there to his retirement party, which is 1992. And they said, uh, the guy came up and talked, who's one of the managers who reported to him. And they said, you know, Bob had nine sales managers and eight of them were women and they were me. And when I left, he replaced it with another woman. <laughs> That's the thing is my father said, women work and men talk. Mm. So it's kind of a practice that I, I, I say I followed. Uh -huh. uh, the other is that he was really kind of dedicated to giving people, everybody opportunity. People that were, it wasn't obvious that they were going to be stars, but he gave them opportunities and, and he pushed them. So I would say this is my, this is my father's legacy. My father has helped lots and lots of people. Awesome. Who might not have had other opportunities. Is your dad still alive? He is. Yes. All right. So well, does, he, does he live near you? You see him much? He lives in Indiana. Okay. He lives in Beverly Shores, Indiana. Him, my, my parents do. Right now, they're in Austin, Texas. They're with my brother, visiting my brother. Mm -hmm. So I work at I, I get a job at IBM. And by the way, IBM had a no nepotism rule, and everybody in my family's worked at IBM. <laughs> so the way the deal worked was, the sales managers would just say, "You hire my kids, I'll hire you." I'll yeah, hire yeah. you. Yeah. Right. It's just, frankly, it's just economics. It's just incentives. And this is the, there are a lot of unintended consequences when governments or people put in these rules. Sure. To figure out a way to get around them. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I'm working at uh, IBM and I get, uh, I get assigned to the number one copier salesperson in the country. And he said, I'm the number one salesperson in the country. Your job is to make sure we don't lose any installs. And don't F it up because I'm number one. <laughs> no problem. So I ended up writing this algorithm. So I was actually one of the first people in Chicago they put in charge of the personal computer. And so I, I was a systems engineer. I was working on the personal computer. And they had something called VisiCalc. VisiCalc was their first spreadsheet, okay. which was followed by Lotus One Two Three. Mm. Wow! So I was a person in charge of of that. So I started. I wrote my own macro programming language for those, and I wrote algorithms on how to discover sales opportunities that ended up getting rolled out throughout all IBM. So I think I was, I was 21 at the time, and I remember the training in IBM. You go through training, and they say to you, uh, in a nice way, if you're not a salesman, you're a nobody. Hmm. They didn't say it exactly like that, but say yeah, the yeah. chairman, a salesman, president's a salesman, anybody who's anybody. This is a sales sure. company. A sales-driven organization, yeah. Yeah, and... I wasn't. I was just this little nerdy kid. You said you're introverted, right? Oh, I'm mega introverted. Yeah, that's you would never know that today. I could be, I'd say, half as introverted, and I would still be super introverted. <laughs> extremely introverted. Except when it comes to business, because if in business, if you don't talk to people, you don't eat. Absolutely. So therefore... Uh, in business, I've learned to talk to people. But when I was at IBM, 
remember this lady who knew my father. She called my father and said, you know, I think your kid, I think he's smart, but we can't get him to talk. It's kind of a pattern in my life. <laughs> Maybe there's something there. Uh, so I, she tells my father, we can't get the kid to talk. So I decide this is not a place for me. So I leave. So I'm 21, 21, 22, I leave. And I start my own computer consultant company. Remember, it was called YDR Computer Services. It was me and two friends of mine from Venezuela. My best friend was a guy named Yun Goicoechea, a guy named Diego Ferrer, still a really good friend of mine. Um, like a lot of young people that age, I knew a lot more about technology than business. Mm -hmm. But I kind of did well enough to feed myself. You know, I fed myself and a couple other people. And I remember I was in my friend's house and I was talking to her mother. And I was 21. And I kind of jokingly said, by 22, I'm going to buy myself a Porsche. And she says, you're not buying yourself a Porsche. <laughs> and I said, of course, because since, since she told me that, I said, I'm going to. And I did. Because I'd always save my money. And I said, this was one of the great lessons I learned in my life. Because I'm 22, I have this Porsche, and I'm just imagining how great my life's going to be. Mm -hmm. All the girls are going to like me. I'm going to drive up to the Academy Awards. <laughs> All kinds of silly stuff. And But it turned out to be the most miserable time of my life. And I learned from that is that it is not the stuff that can make you happy. It's achievement that makes you happy. It's your, what you can achieve helping other people and being a leader in something, right? Reaching your potential and helping other people. Absolutely. It's what you achieve that makes you somebody, not the stuff you have. Mm -hmm. So since then, as soon as I like something too much, I get rid of it. Like so I'm out I probably had 30 cars, and as soon as I liked one of them, I just got rid of them. <laughs> um, so I did that, and I did kind of well enough in that company to take care of myself, but then I kind of had this passion for cars. So it turns out in the mid-'80s, there was the dollar was very strong against the Deutsche Mark. Mm -hmm. So you could go import Mercedes and Porsches, from Germany, that was called the green market car business. So then I was in the green market car business. You said green market? Gray market. Gray market, yeah. gray market car business. Gray market car business, right? You would bring in cars from Germany, Porsches and Mercedes from Germany. You retrofit them for the Department of Transportation and the EPA, and then you could sell them for like $10,000 less than you could buy them at a dealer. So that ended up being kind of a big industry. Uh, for a little while until the dollar Deutsche Mark, the exchange rate flipped. So I'm doing that. And then um, I got a call from a company who somehow heard about me. And they said, hey, why don't you come to L.A. and help us in this? So I had a, I had a friend that was in L.A. and right, I'm 24, got nothing else to do. <laughs> so I go to L.A. Uh, so I'm living in LA, I'm doing work with them, doing some advisory work for them for a little while. And then the, the exchange rate flips. Okay. This, this is the, doing the car stuff too. The gray market car. This, stuff. Exactly. This is doing the gray market car. So I went there to help them. All of a sudden the, the exchange rate flips, there's no more business. Mm -hmm. So I started writing programs for a commodity trading fund. And this was the first Bernie Madoff. So I was so I was teaching myself uh, trading theory, and I was writing these programs. But he would take all the good trades and put it in his account and spread out all the bad trades to his customers. Wow. So I see this, and I said they're going to throw the programmer in jail. So I called my father and say, hey, uh, "Can I stay at your house? I think I'm going to come back to Chicago." <laughs> 
And I, I reached out to somebody that I had known who was a trader at the Mercantile Exchange. And I said, I will work for you for free for six months if you just let me on the floor. So when I was in a writing these programs, I had started really studying trading and I got pretty good at writing algorithms that would tell you when to place trades. So I started giving these recommendations to people to just to test and see whether my these algorithms worked or not. So it turns out they, they kind of worked. So I decided I'm coming back to Chicago. I work for free for six months. So my day would typically start out about, I asked my father if I could, my parents if I could stay. It was really my mother that had to give me okay. <laughs> So I'm there, I'm giving them some rent, but I, I, they give me a room. Uh, my day would start out at 3.30, I would get up because they were living in Wheaton, I'd have to take the train downtown because of trading, I had to be there by, uh, by six o'clock. So I'd get up at three, get on the train, go down there, uh, and then I would, I would just, study. So I would work for free between whenever the market opened, like seven to one thirty or two. I started out in the Japanese yen. Then I moved to the Euro dollars. And then I started just later trading for my for myself. But my day would start at three thirty until I had to force myself to go to sleep. I would go to the library until that closed at the Merkin until like five at five. I would then go home and I would, in fact, I never wanted to leave my room. So I put some, I put a weight set inside my room. So I didn't have to leave my room. <laughs> uh, so I did that and I got pretty good at, um, I got pretty good at, at trading. And then in, um, this would have been in 19, 1989, which was a really hard year for me. A um, couple of things happened. I I funded my best friend's brother-in-law's business. It's a mistake. <laughs> uh, and that year, a guy who was like my brother, his name is Yon Goikoichea, he's from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And we would always be having these, these discussions about what was worse, communism or racism? Now, of course, I knew nothing really about communism outside watching things like Animal Farm and stuff like that. I had no practical connection. Sure. My grand, my uh, my maternal grandfather was from Cuba, but he died when my mother was young, so he left. I mean, I'm way pre Castro, mm -hmm. but. His family, my friend Yun's family, had to leave because of Castro. So they lost everything, and they actually experienced that. Um, and I remember this whole time we were talking, we would, we would have these things, and I remember that I was later, now I remember, I was so uninformed about communism and socialism. Mm -hmm. Um so anyway, in 1989, uh, he got killed. Him and his sister were in a car. They got killed by a drunk driver. Oh, man. Sorry to hear that. Uh, so I spent, I remember, and I'm not an emotional person. I can count on the, my hands how many times I've cried in my whole life. But that was one. I was just messed up for six months. Uh, because he had all, I also learned from him to love my family. Because he was a guy, I mean, he was really close to his family. He was like, his mother was his best friend. And he was felt responsible for his younger brothers. He was a guy who was all about family. Mm. And uh, he was really my best my best friend. About, so the, was, about the same age as you then, Robert? Yes, exact same age. Okay. He was, my birthday is December 31st. 
His was January 22nd. Okay. So it was same age, exactly. Uh, family paid for me to go to Venezuela. It's the first time I went to Venezuela. I was 23 years old. Um, but yeah, we were really close, really close friends. And so 1990, then I ended up having to take over this, take over this business because I had introduced this person to people that I, that I knew and he hadn't done a good job. And I remember that my, my father said about your reputation. So I felt my reputation was tied to this work and I had to go stop trading, which I really loved um, because it fit my personality and go clean up this mess. And then from there, I turned that into a company that wrote financial modeling systems. So I wrote most of the financial modeling systems for Sears and Abbott Labs and Mellon Bank and Farmers and a lot of companies. In fact, I think I wrote the world's largest spreadsheet-based financial modeling system. Wow. Uh, I had created a methodology for creating applications using enterprise-wide applications using spreadsheets. Wow. And wow. so I, I did that. I took it over. And then a couple years later, my father retired from IBM. And we started a company called Blackwell Consulting together. So this was this would have been 92 when IBM uh, essentially paid people to leave. They gave people packages. All the good people took the packages. <laughs> and my father was one of them. So we started Blackwell Consulting together. So I always tried to convince, I knew my father was a great salesperson and I wasn't. So I tried to get my father, I said, why don't you leave and you can come work with me you know, I'll do all the technical stuff. I'll do the real work. You can just do the sales. You just do that sales stuff. Yeah, of, co of course, you know, in his head, he's laughing. Uh, and now, you know, I know why. Um, so he left. He started Black Hole Consulting. And he, he and I were partners in the company. We took this little company I had, created Black Hole Consulting. And the company did well. But I looked, since I looked at the world really different from my father, my father was really a relationship person. He has an extremely high emotional intelligence. I didn't at all. In fact, when I had, when I started my company, I remember my father, he came to my office and I had an office and I had about six people that worked for the company. They were sitting in the next office together on metal chairs. And my father said to me, never treat your people, never treat yourself better than you treat your people. Absolutely. It's your responsibility to serve them so they can serve the customers. So I, I have never since then ever had an office as good as anybody else in the company. No, it's not, so not even, uh, not even, so yours has been not as nice as anybody else in the company you're saying. No, so I had nothing better. It's some rules in our company. Nobody can call me boss mm -hmm. because my responsibility is to serve the people that serve awesome. our customers. Awesome. This is not about me. So our name, my name has never been on the company. This is, I'm just a part of the team that has, a, I call it a distinct responsibility. And that's how I really see the world. So how long, how long have you thought that way? Your dad's always thought that way. It sounds like he taught you at a young age. Yeah. My father's always taught me to treat people well, but you know, listen, if you, if you, if you have kids, hopefully your kids are smarter than his kid. <laughs> you always have to say you're missing something here. You know, you should think about this differently. Sure. Well, father, but what what you describe though is what you know I describe is that that uh, you know upside down pyramid basically right if you're if you're a real leader you're not there people aren't serving you you're serving th those that are on your team right if you're a great coach a great a great uh, manager CEO uh, you're at the bottom uh, you're you're an upside down py pyramid you're in the bottom and you have all those people above you including your customers and vendors you better be serving otherwise you're just not really 
you're just really not a very good leader compared to old school methodology of here's this pyramid and here's our, our organizational chart and you're at the top and all these people are there working for you, boss, and they're here to serve you. Well, that's a that's a in my opinion, that's a bad uh, culture. Uh, or uh, maybe maybe it's just not my culture, right? No, so I would say first of all, people don't work for the company, they work for themselves. Yeah, yeah. And they will work for you as long as, as it's the best option. Now, right. if they have no options, they will tolerate a bad environment. Yeah. But as soon as they have a better option, they're going to bolt. And if you let, and if your whole company, your organization is left with people that have no other options, you probably don't have the strongest team to compete in the world. Yeah. <laughs> I say no company can grow faster than its ability to attract and, attra and, yeah. and retain great people. 100%. So, yes. So I learned, I would say, I was just, I think God has blessed me, one with great parents, great luck not to have been born affluent. Mm -hmm. So when you're not born affluent, you're either going to fall into despair or you're going to fight through it. Mm -hmm. So luckily, that wasn't really an option for me. Because I don't like going hungry, so I just had to I had to fight through it. So 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 what so what you know you described is is you know the two two amazing blessings in life, right? Number one, born with great parents, uh, and and then secondly, the parents that allow you to establish your own grit by by you know by failing and by by being in tough situations, you got to get yourself out of with their their support and love, right? But but not money. And not things, and 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 I I think that's such a huge huge point that you know the most successful people I know are people like you people people that you know have gotten gone through tough times they've learned they've learned a lot of lessons and they look they look with gratitude on the fact that they had to establish this grit to be stronger in life and and you know too often I I believe people think that success like like you've had in your life and many of our friends have had it's because they had it handed to them. Well, that's not sustainable success, in my opinion. If you've had anything handed to you, you're not usually going to be the leader that that's that that's able to be looked upon uh, with with great great experiences and losses, right? Uh, to go to go on and 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 lead. So again, I I, I love where, you know where you've come from, and, and I want to meet your dad, your dad, and mom someday, buddy. You're you're, uh, sure, you're great people. I'd love to meet them because I, I I could have fun conversations with them for sure. Uh, so yeah, so good. So got, sorry about that. I had to break in because it's just you know those two things. People people don't. Not everybody looks at those two things as 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 the as great blessings that they are. And and boy, we got to we got to have gratitude if we have those two things. Loving parents that that don't let you be the victim, and then and then the the uh, the gratitude that you have that you've been taught to have for the for the tough situations you've had to get through yourself too. Right. That's cool. Yeah. So anyway, so now I'm back to. Uh... I got to take over this this company I'm working with, and we start Black Hole Consulting together. Three years in, I tell my father I want to sell my half of the company to him mm -hmm. because my father grew up in a world of IBM, that kind of world. My world wasn't that. I had what I call the, I don't call the strange people, but the different people. Mm -hmm. People from different countries, people that IBM wasn't going to hire. But these are the people that I believe in because all my friends ended up being kind of foreign. Mm -hmm. When I was when I was uh, in junior high school and high school, there are always some people from some other country. They were immigrants. Their families were immigrants. Sure. When I was studying martial arts, all my friends ended up being Korean mm -hmm. because it was a Korean martial arts and they were immigrants as well. I remember when I would have, I would have discussions when I was young about, with my Korean friends, about, because I saw the world as black and white. That's the way the world was. Mm -hmm. You know, white people are mean, and they did all this stuff to us. And they say, he'd say, no, 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 it's not them. It's the Japanese. <laughs> the Japanese are the evil people in the world because they did all this stuff to us. And then later I would have, I, I have friends that were from Serbia and they say, no, 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 no. This <laughs> is, it's the Catholics. 
And I'm thinking, wait, aren't you guys the same skin color? Sure. So I really had to rethink this thing. Obviously, later, it's just it's kind of just tribalism. Sure. Uh, and then later, I realized that anybody that gets their pride from their ethnicity is not much of a person. Mm. You know, if what you have to be proud of is the fact that you're black or that you're white or that you're something, yeah. you're not a, you're a pretty shallow person. Because listen, Martin Luther King was a great man. Mm-hmm. I had zero to do with it. Yes, yes. I don't get credit for that. Now, in the case of blacks in this country, it is important to say you have nothing to be ashamed of. There are people who've done great things. And we should, you should be a proud of that. The same kind of reason why I would say Italian Americans. I remember like talking to Italian Americans about like The Godfather. Yeah. Godfather, that's a really cool movie. But they hated it. And the reason why is because it's a, it portrays the criminal element in our community as heroes. Mm. That's what it does. Sure. And I'm saying, hmm, that's kind of like us. Because every nightmare, uh, I reveal the nightmare of black people when they watch TV. You listen to the news and they say, something bad happened. Somebody did something really bad to some other people. Yeah. And if you're black, at least in my generation, my parents' generation, it's like, please don't let him be black. Uh, They're going to come out with some crazy looking stuff in their head. They're not going to be able to talk. And it's like, oh my God, please. So anyway, this is, I got an appreciation. Luckily, that's another thing that I, I think I got lucky is being born in this country. Even though we had, we have a history that has been, unkind to blacks. There was a different set of rules for blacks. And why most people think that in the civil rights era and things like that, it was government to the rescue. I say it wasn't government to the rescue. It was government that caused the problem in the first place. If the government, which to me is a proper rule of government, had protected everybody equally, if there was equal protection under the law, there would have been no Jim Crow laws. There would have been no lynching. It was a failure of government that caused those, those problems. So anyway, I, I sell my father my have the company because I just didn't like getting in arguments with my father over business. I said, this is my father. I'm supposed to respect my father, but I don't agree with him. The math is not working for me. So therefore, I said, I have to leave because that is too much for me. This was the uh, mid-90s, end of 90s? This was 95. I sold them my half of the company. So so it's 95. I sell them my half of the company. About that time, I'm, I'm 34. Uh, it's about the time people starting to think about having families and stuff. I got a girlfriend. I decide I'm going to I'm going to buy a house. So, somebody told me to look over in the area called North Kenwood, which was by Hyde Park. They said I think this is going to be a hot area. So, that that area which was the last piece of undeveloped land that was near the lake between Hyde Park between 35th Street on the north and 47th Street on the south. Mm -hmm. I said, this is never going to last. So I remember that I grew up, even though we were, my parent, my family wasn't affluent by any means. Uh, I lived in an economically integrated black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. My grandparents did both in Philadelphia and in Louisville, Kentucky. And they were safe neighborhoods. My parents had no problems us walking out. There was not a lot of drama. They were not free of drama, but you know, you it was kind of shielded, let's say. 
Um, and so I remembered growing up two things, growing up feeling safe, even though I didn't have any money, to going a place where I didn't feel safe, even though my parents ended up being more affluent. And through my time, I had suffered what, what I call the perception of incompetence. So I remember I was, uh, later when I was trading us on the floor, the Merc, and the guy gave me a compliment. He said, you know, you're, you're really smart, you're honest. You know, you got a lot of white qualities. He says, you're smart, honest, you work hard, you got a lot of white qualities. Oh, man. So, I said, whatever. Uh, but I remember that, and there was a lot of black people that I thought that were part of the desegregation generation that had to endure forced busing and being the first or their parents were the first, and it was not fun. So... In fact, I kind of survived, I would say. My parents forced me to go to church when I was in high school, mm -hmm. something I had no interest in at all. But it, they found a little black neighborhood in Wheaton. In the center of that community was a church, it's called Second Baptist Church. So my parents made me go to, made me go to church, and it turned out it was the smartest thing that ever happened. Because now I could actually, I had people that I felt like I could relate to, I could talk to. So there was this little community of black families that were all good people, except for one or two. Um, and a lot of those people, I'd say, became my friends. And I think in some ways it saved me because I didn't have those relationships. And the other thing, I felt like I was in a foreign land, frankly, when I moved first to Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do this, I sell my company, and then my I'm thinking there are other people like me who remember when our neighborhoods used to be better. In fact, there is no black neighborhood today is as well off as, as it was in 1967. In, today, in today's dollars. Is that yeah. No, not in today's dollars. There's, there, and I'm not talking about incomes. Okay. I'm talking about the conditions of the community. Yeah, yeah. There's not one black neighborhood that's as well off today that's as safe, that is, I, I would just say, is not as well off as it was in 1967. Yeah. In, in, all in all aspects, family, faith, uh, security, all these things. Well, there's a number, number of different things. Uh, a number of different things have happened in these periods. The periods of 19, the 1940s to 1960s and then the 1960s onward. I think it is too much government. Mm -hmm. It created incentives or at least non-disincentives for people not to have babies out of wedlock. So you have lots of fatherlessness, mm -hmm. children, and listen, it doesn't matter whether you're white, black, or from the moon. I think God made men and women. They're equal, but different. And there's a reason why we have families. Yes. yes. People without families have real problems. Absolutely. So that is a phenomenon, frankly. It's a global, it's everywhere. Yeah. So anyway, I said, I want to make an economically integrated black neighborhood. So no government money, just an economically integrated black neighborhood. So I think there are people who are about my age, who are part of the desegreg desegregation generation, mm -hmm. that if you could convince them to come and move, that this was a transitional neighborhood, they had these inner feelings the same way that I did. They wanted their own safe places because you still have to deal in a world where you go to work and you know there's this perception of incompetence. You always have to prove you're not a moron if you're black. That is something that is still the case today. So, turns out, 
Now, everybody else thought we need a, needed a racially integrated neighborhood. What we need to do is to make it attractive for whites to come into the neighborhood and things will get better. And I really disagree with that because I said, if you gotta be able to look at people as equals, you cannot be begging people all the time and expect that they're gonna look at you like an adult. Take care of yourself. I'd say, guys, be a man. Take care of yourself. And then people will look across at you as an equal. But nobody can look at you as an equal when you're begging them for money. Mm. So that was my view. Uh, another thing I got from my, my parents, I would say. So it turns out, so I built the first high end. I started a company called Urban Fishing Development. And started getting calls about charters on Lake Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all about giving, um, you know, the whole thing, if you give a man a fish. Yep. You can eat for a day. So, so I said, if we did that, we created an, a neighborhood that tied to people's aspirations. So I built the first high-end homes, and I named them after famous black people in, famous black people in history. I put the headstones. Paul Robeson, uh, Louis Latimer, Benjamin Banneker, and George Washington Carver. Yes. People, people like that. People that I thought had real character. Mm -hmm. um, and I was right. It, in fact, I remember I went to uh, was talking to the bank about this, and I two things. They said black people are not going to buy expensive homes. That's what they told me. <laughs> Said, okay. So I just had to take my own money. And I did it. So I made a really big bet. Bought a bunch of land. Now, at the time, the land was $2 a foot mm -hmm. versus being in Hyde Park, which is $60 a foot and $100 a foot in Lincoln Park. Sure. So if you can add, you know, there's not a lot lower to go. Sure. sure. So I built the first high-end homes there. They sold. Uh, I did that. And then I... About two years later, I got out of it because I just hated construction. I hated people coming up and saying, what's your union participation and all this other stuff. Listen, God bless them. But I wanted to prove actually that black people could do things and they weren't exactly getting a lot of love in the trade. How, how many homes did you build? Uh, eight. Huh. Eight. So what happened was I got out of it be, and it kind of set their trajectory. And today, even it is still what I had envisioned. It's an economically integrated black neighborhood and everything has changed. If you go back to 94, when I bought that house, there was glass everywhere. Martin Luther King High School was the worst school in the state. Lots and lots and lots of drop. Now there were other things as well. I mean, public, they tore down some public housing, sure. things like that. Uh, but it became an area <coughs> where I think people thought that they could invest. It became a lot more economically integrated, and I thought that everybody benefited from that. So then I, uh, I got out of that. I started EKI Digital in 1998. While I was at Blackwell Consulting, I had written a, a model for a company that was based on electronic knowledge interchange. At the time, there was electronic data interchange. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote a model for a company around uh, electronic knowledge interchange. So it's actually the name of the company. It's called Electronic Knowledge Interchange. And when I started the company, I said the company is going to be two main, three main things we're going to do. Because I started with uh, a friend of mine. I said, one is we're never going to lay anybody off. Because as soon as we do that, we're going to lose trust. So we're going to be prudent. We're going to save our money. And we're never going to lay anybody off. The second is, I said, we're going to be the place where the most talented people in our profession want to work, regardless of where they're from. Because I remember when I was in IBM and they just told me you don't fit in. 
It was a kind of a nice way of them saying, you know, you kind of don't fit in. Uh, so, and the things that I'd learned from my father. So, doesn't matter if you have an accent, if you're a woman, whether you're anything. All that matters is what you produce. That's how we're going to judge people. It's based on what, what they produce. And we were going to be a trusted partner to our customers. We were never going to lie to our customers. We were never going to do things that were in our short-term interest that we would regret later. Uh, then the company, we started the company. The company did really well. Uh, and then in 2000, I was, uh, I was looking at the stock market. And I was actually a trader in 87 during the big crash in 1987. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had written a model and I knew the day it was going to have a major crash. It, it was funny. It happened the exact day. So, but I did something stupid. I, I could figure out in the options markets, the out of the money options, there, I was what's called a gamma trader. Well, I don't want to bore you with too much math. But the, in, in trade, gamma is the delta of the delta. It's acceleration of price changes. So I knew that out of the money options, if traders would sell, they would sell them, means they were collecting money. Mm -hmm. But if the market went down fast, they would panic. It would blow up the prices and they would have to sell. Sure. So that's what I... That's how I ate. Huh. Uh, it was just kind of math and human psychology. Did you know a guy named uh, Tony Saliba back then? What's his name? Tony Saliba. God, it sounds really you know, familiar. Listen to, listen to our podcast from, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago. Tony Saliba is a friend of mine and, and did really well and, and uh, uh, created some al algorithms that people invested in, in his trading methodology and did really, really well. Um, developed a company uh, like and, and uh, data uh, housing and all that that sold eventually for a big chunk of dough and he's building another another business today that's even even bigger but he was he was uh, looked upon as like the uh, uh, favorite child in, the, in on the Chicago floor trading back in the late 80s uh, early 90s I think it was but uh, yeah look him up when you get a chance but listen to his thing he's an awesome guy he's, he lives in Chicago you'd like him a lot you got a lot oh. of, a lot of similar oh. values I, I'll so. definitely do that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so it's 2000. I think the stock market's going to go bad. And I start talking to our people. And this was before the crash, the dot-com crash. And I was telling our people the importance of making money. And they would say, you know, why are you always talking about making money? And I said, because companies that don't make money do bad things to their people. And you're going to find out pretty soon. Mm. So it was early 2000. I, I said, this is in bad shape. So I got out of all the stocks and everything. And that year, Chicago had something called the Ping Pong Festival. So I decided we were going to sponsor the Ping Pong Festival. <laughs> now, the only thing I knew about the table tennis at the time was... I liked it and I played it with my I played it with my father. Those are the memories, frankly, that I say the memories I have of my father when he wasn't yelling at me for doing some stupid teenage thing uh, or pissing off my mother, uh, <laughs> which I had a habit of doing unintentionally. Um, but I remember my mother, I always tell people, you know, when I grew up, I played table tennis with my father. Those are the memories I have of us together, and they meant a lot to me. Uh, and then later he told me, he said, you know, that's not, let me tell you what really happened. So my father's 23 years older than me. I'm a teenager, so he's right in his, what would that be, 30s. And my father worked like a pig. So my mother said to him, you know, I know you're busy and you're focused on your career, but don't forget you have a son. So don't be a bum and spend time with your son. Yeah. That's when he went and bought a table tennis table. Again, I think reacting to my mother. <laughs> and so 
It's funny. It's funny you say that because my my dad and I played ping pong together until I could beat him consistently. Then he stopped playing against me. It was a long, long time, you know, few, for a few years I had to play him before I got to beat beating him, and then he stopped playing with me. But same with my sons. You know, we we uh, my my oldest son, 32, Austin. Him and I played a lot of tables. My son now, Nikita, he's uh, nine, just turned 19. Same way, a lot. You know, we played ping pong together. It's been a lot of our time together. So, how how many families? As I'm sure you found out, many families. You know, around the ping pong table, a lot of lot of uh, bonding goes on, right? Yeah, cool. absolutely. So, anyway, I sponsor sponsor the ping pong festival. They asked me to be the chairman. I, we spent a hundred thousand dollars sponsoring that. Uh, we were by ourselves there. Nobody else was interested in it, which was okay for me. Uh, but we had never done any business in the public sector. So I decided we should actually diversify into the public sector mm-hmm. because I never wanted to. The other thing my father, I'm gonna, this is going to be a story about what my father told me. Mm-hmm. Another thing my father said is about don't be a minority business. Mm-hmm. He said, that's the crumbs. Mm-hmm. It's not serious. So anyway, I started Killer Spin. Killer Spin is going to be the number one company in the world. Started in late 2001. It's going to be the number one company in the world in creating beautiful table tennis experiences. Mm -hmm. So the things that I always, I say, drive me is just being number one in the world at something. I could be the number one dog walker in the world, and that would be okay to me. It's more important to me than money. But I think... If you can be number one in the world or something, you won't be broke, no matter no matter what it is. That's right. So start Killer Spin, and things are going well. We're the number one company in our world in our space. We're creating things that people have never done, and so those are the two companies I have today. So now I'm like, as I think about my life going forward. My view is that, and especially if you're black, there are people who went through some real crap Mm -hmm. to give me the opportunity that I have today. My grandfather was actually the first black person admitted to the University of Pennsylvania, but he couldn't go. He tested in, and this would have been in like 1904 or something. He tested in because he was really smart. But his father died and he couldn't get in. He couldn't because his father died. Now, my grandfather worked three jobs his whole life, was a janitor, and tutored my father in Latin and geometry. And to think about how many people, what that man could have been. Yeah, the difference he could have made in the world. With the talent that he had, yeah. so and my father was the same same thing. My father's road was easier than my grandfather's road. It was easier than his father's road, and my road was easier than my father's road. And hopefully, the people coming behind me. However, I'm concerned that it's not going to be the case. Now, here's my view around the minority minority business program. What what they were intended to do, why they're important, when and how they should work. There is no doubt that blacks were prohibited from participating in the free market. There's no doubt that that happened. My, you couldn't do certain things by law. Mm-hmm. Now. In 1965, right, Martin Luther King fought for, right, us to have what I would call one set of rules. When he talked about being judged by your character and not your color, Mm -hmm. what he meant was you get judged, everybody should get judged based on who they are, their character and what they do. You shouldn't be limited because you happen to be black. Anything else. You shouldn't get any special privileges, but you shouldn't have to be in a war. Should be no disadvantages for sure. You're a disadvantage, have a disadvantage. And that's clearly the case. 
So when Martin Luther King, when they got that done, okay, now you got the Voting Rights Act, you got every civil rights legislation, stuff starts to improve. The one thing that doesn't is having money because nowhere in the world are poor people healthy, educated, and safe. And conversely, nowhere in the world, regardless of their race, are affluent people not healthy, educated, and safe. So how, this is why, through philanthropy, nobody has ever made a dent in poverty. There's only one case in history that relates to black people that I know that actually moved the ball forward through philanthropy. And that was a partnership between Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald, where they built 5,200 schools. The black families had to scrape together nickels to contribute. The black construction capability in the South came out of that partnership because Booker T. Washington was dedicated to blacks working and have the opportunity to work. Well, that's, that's, why, that's why it worked. It wasn't exclusively philanthropy. It was it was. The, it was you had to you had to bring work right to the table to be able to make it work. You had you had that community building it as well, so they had skin in the game, right? By the way, in the Bible it says it's better to give than to receive. In Absolutely. fact, you will receive more as you give. So you do have responsibility. Absolutely, I you a moral responsibility to help other people. I don't think the government has a moral responsibility to decide who gets your charity. Exactly. Another. Exactly. It. However. Martin Luther King started to fight for our participation in the economy. So what happened is, right, Martin Luther King gets killed in 1968. Cities start to burn. And then I believe that there was a group of business people, mostly white, that saw the threat to the country and said, we need to do better. So they created programs and then for blacks to get business. And I think that, but over time, what's happened is the definition of a minority went from somebody black, that's what minority used to be, mm -hmm. to everybody who's not a straight white unventured male. Mm -hmm. So I think it's no, everybody ought to benefit from the free market in, in living in the country. But people go from poverty to prosperity. There's only one track. Entrepreneurial-led economic activity. It leads to the appreciation of education and social capital. Social capital is when you reach back and pull some other people along. But more importantly, you create an aspirational roadmap for your young people so they know where to place their bets. That's why the government doesn't have to convince Dominican kids to play baseball yeah. or black kids to, to play basketball. Mm -hmm. The market tells them that's where to place your bet. Absolutely. So as it comes to minority programs, in my view, the way it should work, for those groups who are poor, I mean, really, you should give opportunity on a voluntary basis, in my view, as it relates to blacks. So I came up with something called the Lead Partner Program. What the Lead Partner Program says, just do business. This system works for everybody. Young people's fascination with Bernie Sanders. That's right. Want to turn us into another country. So, Lee Partner Program says everybody just do business. Do business, and the, the responsibility of the black company is three. One is to identify a clear value proposition, because if you can't do that, you can't be in business. Two, to rethink the mentor protege program to make the black companies the mentors and younger companies, the protégés. Mm -hmm. And then number three, take on some, what I call community enrichment responsibility. So things we're doing is called mowers and blowers. It's microfinance for cutting grass and moving snow. There's a lot of money there. And then number two, something we call a housing tutoring exchange, where you give honorable black college students a place to live in exchange for mentoring and tutoring elementary and high school kids and seniors. So I believe in the price system. It is how people go from poverty to prosperity. We ought to try it. And then over time, all this stuff, this, these artificial things that never work will be eliminated. 
So you and, I, you and I are going to talk a little more about this offline, and we've, we've, we have talked about it a little bit, but I've, I've, ta- I've done a little more research and, and stuff. I, I need a lot more. But I, I've, got, I've got CEOs in the Chicagoland area that are willing to, to, dedicate, to, to focus on the urban communities and, and, and hiring from the urban communities if we have the right team to identify just good kids, good, good kids in high school that want to get a, get, a, get a diploma. Don't start with high school kids. And why is that? Look, here's the problem. And I'm going to tell you from the perspective of somebody who's black. Do you ever, you never hear when people refer to white community or Asian community about starting with kids. You start with adults. You give adults opportunity to add value. They will take care of the kids in their own communities. It's always this cycle of this charity mindset. And I I call these inner city programs the little black kid programs. Mm -hmm. So you give some money to some little black kids, and then what happens is when they become adults, there's nothing for them anymore. Go tie opportunity to responsibility. If you get an opportunity, then you need to take on some responsibility for bringing some other people along. When you do that, in my view, young people will start to believe in the free enterprise system and they will see themselves because they will see other people like them. Imagine you don't see any adults who are successful. Everybody that you see that's successful outside rap and I'm sorry, entertainment, Mm -hmm. which includes sports is white. It reinforces your inferiority complex. So here's here's an I no Robert my my inspiration came through high school. I didn't have a lot of I, I think I had a little drive as a younger guy, but in high school I, I saw people that were successful. I came from a a, a low middle class or like a, a mil, lower middle class family or, or, or I should say you know area, and so there wasn't a ton of success around me, but I but I saw some, and then and then I was inspired by a few adults as a high school guy, guy to to get out and, and make my you know make a little more money doing some other things that I did. And then, and then coaches, right? And so I, I just believe that if it, in the we're in the in the business world that I'm 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 familiar with, right, where we hire we hire a good amount of people every year, and a lot of my friends do, um, you know, we're looking for talent, and we can train, we we can teach over a four year period somebody from a high school diploma to a 22 year old kid from, from from having no real business experience in the business world, finance finance and accounting, even if they have very little. Uh, very little strength in, in math, let's say, right? We can teach them sales and marketing. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to be great at it. We can teach them work ethic probably first before we teach anything else and, and what we do in the field. And then in the end, teach them teach them operational operational excellence in what we believe in, being number one in the world at what we what we do is our goal always, and, and teach them these things. In four years, I'm confident that our, our four years – of, of internship can be way, way better, way, way better than a four year undergrad that I see today. And, and so that, that's kind of my thing is if we, if we have opportunities like entry level job opportunities, why not, why not inspire kids in high school to, to, to say, why wouldn't you want to work for the Ray Bynes, the Med Lines, the, these, these companies in the Chicago area that have these core values that you must live by to work for them and, and then have our, our, our teams in there, myself and our CEOs, as well as our leaders in there talking about how much fun it is to be amongst our culture and in, 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 in in living by our core values. So I, I just think that there's some opportunity I, there. Listen, I think what you're saying is noble. So don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. I think it's noble and it'll be impactful for a few kids. It will be impactful for a few kids. Mm-hmm. However, there's a difference between resources and aspiration. Aspiration is more important than resources. So you can help, let's say that you help 100 kids. Mm -hmm. Now, there are groups that go into the Chicago public school system, Year Up and others, which go into the Chicago public school system. And what they do is they have very well-meaning people. And they'll have a group of 10 or 15, usually people that have graduated from college and will go in and be helpful things like that. And maybe they can touch 10, 20, 100, 200 kids. There are 500,000 kids in the Chicago public school system. 
85% of them fall below the poverty line. So if you can go and you've got 500,000, it's not like it stops, right? Every year, 125,000 of those. Or, add, go, or come back, come in again, yeah. So what you're doing is if you go help 100, that's noble, mm -hmm. not transformational. Transformation happens. Do you realize that in the last 25 years, India and China have taken 750 million people out of poverty? The free enterprise. I mean, capitalism. Exactly. So what happened is they empowered, they empowered their entrepreneurs. Their entrepreneurs did two things. They created industry, which creates employment, but more importantly, they created aspiration for millions of people. Yep. Reason why blacks believe in entertainment, sports, all that, is because there's market evidence that it works. So while it's nice and noble that whites or anybody else helps young blacks, the few that they can actually help themselves, what's more important is that you create a movement that proves that the free enterprise system works and you get everybody to do a little bit. So we're, we're going to talk more about this offline because we're running out of time, but I'll tell you right now, buddy, this will create more, more of a, uh, more, more, more of a, uh, more traction towards this exact subject. So you got to start with the 20 CEOs I'm talking about and, it, and hopefully it becomes 200, 300, 400, 500, instead of hiring a few hundred people a year from the system and not just hiring, actually training to be, to be entrepreneurs themselves, right? And, and, and having four, four years of education that you don't, you don't pay anything for, you get paid for, of course, and you have zero debt at the end of four years in, in a culture you understand to, 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 be able to, to be able to go on to be an entrepreneur or in the organization. One question before you go. It could, it could be thousands in the long run. One, no, one question before you go. Yeah. Okay, since you're my friend, I can ask you. Absolutely, That's always. If you were to take the revenues of all the companies that you're talking about, mm -hmm. these 200, Estimate what that would be. The first 20 companies I'm talking about will be around a uh, 20, 20 billion, 20 billion in revenues for the first 20, 20 companies. Okay. So $20 billion. So you got CEOs that are running companies, $20 billion. Now imagine this. What if everybody just did business? They did business and tied opportunity to responsibility. This is what, listen, the economy depends on supply and demand. Absolutely. Where if you fix the demand problem, you will fix the supply problem, and the supply problem gets fixed by people's aspirations. In my view, you'd be more impactful if you just did business in a meaningful way. What if you guys said between us, Mm -hmm. We're going to go have $50 million of real significant relationships, real business with black companies. And in exchange for that, we're going to hold them accountable to doing this other stuff. That to me is more impactful because people then will compete for that opportunity. And when they're competing for the opportunity, they have to prepare themselves for those opportunities. Sure. Sure. So here's my thing. Most of these companies do try to do that some, in some aspects, some not very well, some well, right? Of this group I'm telling you about and the next 180 that, I'll be, that I would be talking about next. But, but here, here's, I, we, I believe there's a huge hole right now in, in finding great people, right? And, 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 and mentoring and training great people. Listen, I'm going to tell you, we need to do this and we should have a meeting with your CEOs because I'm going to tell you, if we don't prove the free enterprise system works. It's going to be gone. <clears throat> going to lose it. Ber Bernie's going to Bernie is going to you know dominate it and and I don't think it's just Bernie. It's a lot of the people from the from, uh, from other parts of politics here that don't claim to be socialists that actually act like them. And and I uh, I see a lot of that going on in our own state in our own backyard which scares me, right? So, hey, I um I got to tell you I I want to have you on again sometime because we didn't get enough of you, dude. You're you're awesome and and uh, your mind thinks in a way that's just so so much so much fun and it's so so uh, uh well, rewarding to anybody that's listening to you. But but I tell you, yeah. Whenever you want to talk to somebody crazy, I'm your guy. Well, we're we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot more because we're gonna continue to get to be better friends as we grow older. 
But you know, when I, when I think about your story, it's awesome to think of a kid working at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old selling gum, right? And 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 creating you know cash and, and understanding the value of, of serving the kids that don't even like you in many cases, probably, right? Pretty cool. And and then when when you think of uh, you know the passion you had that 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 you know selling gum and making money doing that, and then and the ice cream thing is funnier than that. That the, the school asked you to sell ice cream too, so they could sell some ice cream. So, but that that mentality you gained as a young man really tran, trans, translated into the success you had later, in my opinion. You know, the, you know when when it came to, to serving, uh, you know serving your customers. When it came to the, you know the, the understanding the stock market and and trading, right, and 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 being successful there. Uh, then, then I think of. Uh, I, I think of you working with your dad, that your 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 original mentor, probably the best mentor in your life, and yet realizing, hey, you, you don't you don't you, maybe you're not perfect partners in business, but and realizing that's pretty cool. But that this this is a guy you love and and is your mentor. It just shows you you could you could love that person next to you. It doesn't mean it's a perfect fit in business, right? Uh, sure. So there's so many cool lessons, and and then and then you get get into the into the ping pong business, uh, an industry that's old, that's been around a long time, and for you to challenge it to be the best in the world at that. Uh, awesome. I mean, it's an awesome, oh, last thing, awesome story. Last thing. I have a favor. Yeah. A little favor I'm going to ask you, and now I'm going to let you go. So one of the things we've decided with Killer Spin, we're creating what I call this unplug and play movement. Mm -hmm. And it's all about connecting with people you love and that need your love through break time play. So one of the things that we're, we're going to do is we're going to create an agent <laughs> program so all our things are going to get sold through agents. And we're going to have young people that are affected by autism and other things become the agents. So we're going to ask people, listen, if you're going to consider buying something, please consider buying something from one of our, age, from one of our agents. Because what happens is with kids when they get, after they graduate from high school, they're in these transition programs for a couple of years. And then they're lost. They have nothing. So our goal is to help young people and their families, frankly, mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. successful. And I think when you dedicate yourself to something bigger than yourself, life usually works out. Absolutely. And you, and you mentioned a word a few times there that, may, that, that the many of us are kind of you know, shy and saying, you know, it's, it sounds a little geeky or man, it sounds too, uh, too fuzzy maybe. And it's love, right? I mean, if you can bring love in a work environment and family family environment that that playing ping pong does or a work environment we got a ping pong table in our in our place that gets used off all, all all the time too here and 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 relationships grow tighter because of it but again if you can go to work every day knowing that that there's that people love you there right compared to maybe going after another job where you make five percent ten percent more at what are you going to do right you want to stay in that loving environment and and i think it's so important that that more leaders like you and i talk about that because we're, we're kind of afraid to say that it's kind of a it's kind of a you know a terminology that gosh can you really use that and i i believe we can uh and i gotta tell you one thing, one thing we aspire to in every business we have is being number one in the world or the world class in that. And that's an overused terminology, right? But if you can seriously, you know, strive to be, for, you know, you know, in the, in the top one percent, you're going to be successful. You mentioned this today. If you can be number one in the world, yeah, you're probably not going to go broke. And and you're exactly right. Uh, so so I, I love that that thought because I, I I agree with and I and I and I try to inspire my team to think that way always. If we can't strive to be the best in the world in this business we're in. Why the heck are we here, right? So uh, I I uh, I really really appreciate uh, you, buddy, as a friend, and and you being on the, on our on our podcast today. By the way, by the way, look out look out from an email from your niece Alia. She's going to say, "Dear Uncle Gary, I'm a killer spin agent. I want to come and talk to you." Alia. Yes, that's my daughter. All right, awesome. I want to I want to meet her. Okay, uh, and I cool. want to meet. I want to meet your dad too. Let's get out to lunch with your dad. I, I will. So, All right. she, listen, she's coming to sell you. I don't care. That's great. I want to talk to Alia. <laughs> okay, she's your kid. I got to meet her. All, All right. right. All right, brother. Hey, awesome talking to you. I'm for you. No, you're awesome. It's so much fun to listen to you, and I really appreciate your time. I know it's valuable. And let's uh, let's get get together in the near future. Okay. I appreciate it. Take care. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert. And uh, thanks, and uh, and have a great day. And we have another awesome edition of Ditch Digger CEO. See ya.